Crowds are flocking to see John the Baptist baptized in the River Jordan. And here, Matthew recounts how Jesus joins the crowds and himself asks to be baptized by John. It's an interesting story in that it pictures Jesus in an activity that would seem sort of unnecessary for him. Why would Jesus bother to be baptized? Why baptism? Would you please stand for the reading of the Gospel? At that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River so that John would baptize him. John tried to stop him and said, I need to be baptized by you, yet you come to me? Jesus answered, Allow me to be baptized now. This is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. So John agreed to baptize Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, he immediately came out up out of the water. Heaven was open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and resting on him. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, who I dearly love. I find happiness in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Like, probably most of you, not all of you, but probably most of you, <clears throat> I was baptized as an infant, as was my brother and my sister. My mother was raised Presbyterian. Um, she and her family attended worship most weekends, and that was pretty much the extent of their involvement in church. My dad, who was raised in the same hometown, who was two years older than my mom, who ended up, they ended up being high school sweethearts. My dad was raised in the Lutheran church. Um, if you would ask my dad, he would tell you they lived at church, and he didn't like it. As a kid, and I'm not knocking the Lutheran church, don't think that for a minute, but my dad's experience in his church was one of, it was a lot of rules, it was very dry, the worship services always went longer than an hour, it was not kid friendly, and as a kid, he would have rather been doing just about anything. So my parents grew up, and when my dad graduated from high school, he went off to college, and it was his turn to decide whether or not he was going to continue going to church, and I don't even think it was a decision. I think he had decided to cut ties with the, the Lutheran church and maybe church altogether. It was something that he never wanted to do again. Two years later, my mom graduated from high school. They got married in my mom's Presbyterian church, and from that point forward were members of a Presbyterian church for the rest of their lives. Um, they lived in a number of different places and so were members of a whole variety of Presbyterian churches, but one thing was very consistent, they rarely attended. We were Christmas and Easter attenders when I was growing up. Um, it was important for my parents to belong to a church, but it absolutely, church held really very little significance for them for, for many years. When they got toward retirement, things in their life had changed and, and that changed, but for years and years, church held very little significance for them. And yet, when I was born, when my brother was born, when my sister was born, we were all baptized as infants. Why? Why? Why would they bother doing that? Okay, so then I grew up. I grew up and I grew up in a, in a family, right, where I was not used to going to church, and, and I graduated from high school and went on to college and never really considered going to church. It had never been a habit. I met the man who would be my husband and who would be the father of my children. I'm divorced now, but he had grown up uh, United Methodist, had gone to church every weekend, had uh, been in youth, and um, had kind of liked it. And um, it was important to him once we got married and moved here to St. Louis, because this is where we started our lives. He had a job here. Within a couple weeks, he wanted to make sure that we found a United Methodist Church, which I thought was really interesting because I'd never known him to go to church. So we found a United Methodist Church and we became members and we rarely ever attended. And I thought, okay, I understand this. I've been in this habit before. This is just how my family did it. And then we started having kids. My daughter was born and guess what happened? We had her baptized as an infant. My son was born and guess what? We had him baptized as an infant. Why? Church held very little interest for either one of us at that time. 
in my life. Very little interest. But I'm telling you what, baptism for some reason seemed to be important. And it's, and it's interesting because in our culture, in the culture we're in, where mainline Protestant denominations are having trouble putting enough people in the pews on a Sunday to keep some churches open, infant baptism for so many people is still a given. People who have no connection to the church at all feel the need to have infants baptized. We know that in the surrounding zip codes around this church, at least 40% of the folks are unchurched. They claim no faith tradition. And yet for many of those folks, infant baptism is a given. Why? Why? Why is this? Is this not odd when you think about it? Really when you think about it? Is that not weird? People with no connection to the church and probably very little use for God call for baptism? And Okay, and so you might be thinking, now hold on a minute. You do not have to be a member of a church to believe in God. Well, no, you're absolutely right. You don't. You absolutely don't. And I know there are people who are not connected to the church who have daily prayer life and, and may um, read their Bible and even do independent study. I understand that. There absolutely are people out there like that. But you know, if you're serious about your daily prayer and you're serious about reading of the Bible and you're, you're really open to whatever it is that God is trying to, to tell you or nudge you or in, in ways that God is trying to direct your life, eventually a person can't help but be drawn to worship in community. To, to, to want to learn with others. This is a really natural outcome of daily prayer. We need our alone time with God, but alone time with God where we're really listening to God and paying attention to what God wants, it's going to lead us to the church. Now, you, you, you can believe in God and not be a part of the church, absolutely. No doubt about it. But it is really tough. It is really tough to be a Christian in isolation. It really is. It's a real challenge. God calls us through Jesus Christ to be the church. And eventually we need to realize that and understand it and be in the church. So, so we have people with no connection to any church, including this one, call for baptism. Now you've got to remember that when I had my kids baptized, I didn't have a clue, so I'm not cutting anybody down by saying this, all right? I was one of these folks, although I belonged to a church, I just never went. <laughs> I'm not sure it's any better. It's maybe even more hypocritical, you know? I don't know, maybe even more hypocritical. But we'll get these kind of calls, and I think it's probably because this place is so darn big. People live around here, and if they're on 141 on a daily basis, or Manchester Road, they can't help but see our church, and they think, we need to get that baby baptized. Let's try that place, right? So we get these calls, and if they have to do with a baptism, it goes through to clergy. And so there are times when if I'm there, I'll get the phone call, and the conversation will go something like this. I will say hello, and the person on the other end will say, uh, we have a baby, we need to get baptized. And I'll say, are you a member of Manchester United Methodist Church? No. Do you attend Manchester United Methodist Church? No. But our baby's almost six months old. We got to get this done. <laughs> I'm telling you, people get panicky, you know? And it's usually for one of two reasons. And it's kind of interesting if I get them to talk, because my next question is, in a very nice way, I say, tell me why you want to have your baby baptized, and what's the rush? And depending on who they are and what the reason is, one reason is, well, first of all, some people are just surprised that a pastor would even be asking that question. Why do you want to get your baby baptized and what's the rush? For folks who really aren't connected to a church or really fully understand, well, none of us fully understand baptism, but have a better idea of what baptism is, there is this kind of underlining weird idea that baptism is sort of this, this magic spell, this bubble wrap around a child that somehow is going to protect them, or um, you can only get to heaven if you've been baptized, and heaven forbid something bad would happen, and so we need to get them baptized right away. Even though these folks have nothing to do with the church or God any other time in their lives, it's kind of like... They don't really believe this, but just in case we're right, let's get ourselves covered, you know? I mean, there really is something to that. There is something to that. And, and I just, my heart goes out. My heart goes out to these folks. And so that is an opportunity for me to say, you know what? 
I would love it if you would come worship with us this weekend. Let me tell you about a couple of our services you might really enjoy. And we have a nursery, right? And when you come, see if you like what we have to offer. And we could set up a time to sit down and talk about all of this. And I would love to meet you, you know. But I make sure that they know about the grace of God. God's grace. God loves you and God loves your baby, baptized or not. You do not have to worry. There is no rush involved with this. This. And I think sometimes we might get people come in out of curiosity just to see what it's like. And I think probably for some of these folks, they just move to the next church on the list and call that one, see if they can get a baptism there instead. The other reason, which I think is probably even more prevalent, <coughs> is that you've got a young couple with a baby and they've moved here from, this is not their hometown, and they haven't found a church. <laughs> and grandma and grandpa are chomping at the bit for that baby to be baptized and they've got to find a church to get that baby baptized because grandma and grandpa want it done and they want it done now. These, these, this couple, the young couple is willing to go along with, I don't know, what they probably just consider a quaint tradition, you know, just to make their parents happy. This happens all the time. Now, I'm not saying any of this is wrong or bad or whatever, you know. But, but why? Why baptism? Why baptism? Why? Why, why, why? And speaking of why baptism, we look at our scripture today. You know, why would Jesus get baptized? Now, this, this is not infant baptism, right? This is, this is they're in the bat, probably a baby there getting baptized because... John the Baptist, you know, is a preacher and a prophet, and he is big on his whole message is repent, repent, repent. Turn your life around. Give your life over to God, right? You brood of vipers. And then he takes them into the water, and as they repent, the water is there to ritually cleanse them, right? So we need to remember that this baptism, it's not Christian baptism. And see, I think that's easy to forget, too, because, hey, we're in the Gospels. Jesus is there, but yeah, no, but Jesus hasn't started his ministry yet. John the Baptist is a Jew, Jesus is a Jew, and everybody in that crowd surrounding the River Jordan, they're all Jews. But this is where it all begins. So it's all about repentance. So what in the world would Jesus be doing there getting baptized? And John's thinking the same thing. He sees Jesus come to get baptized, and he pushes back. He says, you shouldn't be baptizing me. Oh, no, he says, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says to him, essentially, go along with me on this. We need to do this, right? And so he does. He baptizes Jesus. And what happens? As Jesus comes up out of the water, a voice from heaven announces that Jesus is God's son, the one with whom God finds happiness. And I'm thinking, whoa, that's probably the first time that's happened at the River Jordan. That would be probably the first time that has taken place. See, this is different. Baptism is about, for grown-ups, repentance, and it's about washing away of sin and all of that and, right, and, and a righteous relationship with God. Absolutely, it is all of that. But, but for Jesus... It's about commissioning. It's about the inauguration of his ministry. It's about the assurance of God's presence. Baptism establishes Jesus' identity. Baptism establishes Jesus' identity. Whether John the Baptist fully understood what was going on, whether that crowd of people around the Jordan River had any idea what was happening, God knows. And God is true. And God is absolutely steadfast. And I think that we need to keep that in mind. I think the idea that we need to fully understand baptism before baptism can happen is, is a joke because we could never fully understand baptism. The more we understand, the better. That's important. And we do. We talk about baptism up here quite a bit. We need to learn about it because it, it, we want to receive the grace from baptism. And the more we understand, the more open we are to the grace. But the idea that we would have parents in here who might not fully understand what's going on or are so tired from being up with the baby the night before, they're really not paying attention to the vows, or that we've got some people in the congregation who are saying vows back who really aren't paying attention to what they're saying but just rattling them off, you know, does that somehow invalidate the baptism? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. God is true and absolutely steadfast. And we need to understand that those empowering words of grace that are spoken to Jesus are also spoken for us. 
that we also are God's dearly loved children and within us God finds happiness. There is in our uh, baptismal liturgy, there is a really beautiful uh, prayer over the water that I don't usually use during a baptism. Now we don't have a baptism tonight, but I've got our baptismal font. The fonts are different. You know, anywhere you go, the fonts are different. We have a simple brass bowl. In our large sanctuary, we have a beautiful, it's more like a piece of furniture, and it fits up in the, the chancel, of course, and it's big and it's white and it has a beautiful brass round dome on it. And the first time I ever saw it, I thought, that looks like R2-D2. <laughs> and now every time you see it, you're going to think of R2-D2, but it is a beautiful, beautiful baptismal font. It really is. In 2010, I had the opportunity to go to England, and I had the opportunity to go to the church that John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was raised in, and the font that was used to baptize him is still being used. It's this big stone font, and it wasn't behind velvet ropes. You could go right up to it, take the lid off, and put your hand in the water. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. It's amazing, but the water is important, and so we listen to the sound of the water. And this Thanksgiving prayer over the water is one that I don't usually use. It's not a part of the liturgy that's required for baptism, but it is beautiful. And I would like for you to hear it every once in a while. It's gorgeous. So listen to this. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make, the, make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit and bless this gift of water and those who receive it to wash away their sin, to clothe them them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Isn't that gorgeous? So tonight, we don't have a baptism, but this is baptismal water. And later on, will consecrate the elements. You'll be glad to know I am not touching the bread or the juice. Pastor Nancy's going to do all that. I'm staying far away from it. But all that will be consecrated and it's set up so that as you come forward to receive Holy Communion, you know, you'll come up this way. You are welcome to touch the water and remember your baptism and be thankful. Touch the water and remember that you are God's beloved child and in you God finds happiness. And if you haven't been baptized, the same holds true for you. You go ahead and touch the water and you know God loves you. And if you are considering baptism or want to talk about baptism, you give me a call and I'll tell you all about it, okay? We are blessed. We are hugely, hugely blessed. And I think that's it. Amen. Oh,